Welcome back, literary slummers, to another episode of Shelf Aware, the podcast where we challenge each other to read books outside our comfort zone. I'm Em. And I'm Anna. This fortnight on Shelf Aware, we are continuing our discussion of the new adult genre. So um, if you remember, the first book in this unit was The Mister by E.L. James. <laughs> um, and it kind of kicked off our whole unit on new adult because it is not a genre that I read very often or really want to read is the bottom line there. Um, (laughs) So this fortnight, M found a book for us to read that was pretty, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was pretty like indicative of the whole genre Mm. or pretty representative. That's the word I'm looking for of the genre as a whole. And it was like one of the earlier new adult books as well. Yeah. Um, so before we like really dive into the meat of this book, um, we or M has done a little bit of research into the new adult genre to kind of describe a little bit more about it and what its stereotypes are or what it's all about. What we can what we can look forward to reading in future mm. new adult books. I don't know. All right. So here's the thing. No, that's not how I'm starting this. <laughs> Here's the tea. Here's the tea (laughs) on new adult. What is new adult? Is it anything? I'm still not sure. Undecided. (laughs) The idea of new adult, and I've got an outline here, but feel free to jump in if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Sure. The basic idea of new adult is that it is a similar genre to other age-based genres such as YA, middle grade, kid lit, early reader, anything like that. Mm -hmm. So these types of genres exist to fill a specific market niche and they're meant to address the issues of an audience within a distinct age range. So in the case of new adult, that would be people from the ages of loosely 17 to 27, 28. So like late teens, uh, early to mid 20s. So because it's meant to address issues of an age range, the actual content can theoretically vary greatly. So with YA, Mm -hmm. this is really, really evident, right? So like all other genres exist within YA. YA is just a distinction to say like, this is this genre, but we are doing it in a way that will appeal to a teenaged audience. Um, So you've got like YA fantasy, YA romance, YA poetry. And a clumsy main character. Yes, yes, that was a very a very prevalent uh, trope in YA of uh, the late aughts, especially thanks to Twilight. Yes, um, not to hate on YA, we both read a lot of YA. It's, yeah, 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 it's totally, a good genre. Totally. It's fine. Or umbrella for a genre, I guess you could say. So I, I'm kind of referring to it as like a mega genre or like a macro genre. <laughs> Uh, cause it's like a genre okay, that okay. contains other genres, right? Cause it's not like a sub genre really. Right. Cause it has, I don't know. That's, that's how I'm kind of like thinking of it in my mind in order to make it all make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so theoretically, it's new like adult, a megamorph genre. Yes, exactly. <laughs> has all of them <laughs> within it. Um, so theoretically new adult is this too, right? Where it could contain all of the other genres just in a way to appeal to, uh, people in their uh, really early 20s is kind of who it's appealing to. Yes. Like college age, I would imagine. Yes. Yes. But it kind of doesn't really seem that way when you look at the genre as a whole, because there is one specific genre that is really, really, really overrepresented in the new adult macro genre, right? Which is yes. romance. So erotica. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, So this kind of like begs the question, (laughs) is new adult actually its own thing that could contain all these other things? Or is it just a marketing tool in order to appeal to a people who used to read YA and like all of the angst and longing in that, but are now a little bit older and feel weird reading YA or, and, or Mm -hmm. people who, are interested in romance but are put off by the idea of like kind of the stereotypes of romance like the harlequin dime store you know paperback romance so is this just a repackaging of stuff that already existed essentially um i would say it's kind of both right so it definitely is a marketing Mm -hmm. tool and we can kind of see that like looking at the origins of it so it's a really really new 
genre, whether, you know, you think it is or isn't, it's emergence as a term (laughs) is a new thing. Yes. And actually, specifically, you can trace it back to a specific blog post by S.J. Jones in 2009, which does not exist anymore, but you can find with the Wayback Machine. Um, And I'll link all of the sources that I used to put this shit together in the uh, show notes so you guys can check it out at your leisure. There's some interesting videos and stuff in there if you guys want to take a look. Um, But this blog post uh, was written to announce a... Uh, contest. And this is, I'm just going to go ahead and read directly from this post. So it starts off, attention writers, St. Martin's Press is holding a contest for submissions. Yes, a contest hosted by yours truly to find books to publish. We are actively looking for great new cutting edge fiction with protagonists who are slightly older than YA and can appeal to an adult audience. Since 20 somethings are devouring (laughs) YA, St. Martin's Press is seeking fiction similar to YA that can be published and marketed as adult. A sort of an quote, older YA or, quote, new adult. Yes. So this is the first Mm -hmm. kind of, like, use of this term to mean this specific thing of books that are for the YA audience, but now they're older, so we have to age up the characters, too. Right. So kind of, like, laying it out like this, it's like, okay, this is just a marketing ploy, right? But this isn't really that different to how YA got started, uh, because the term young adult Mm -hmm. to describe YA fiction as a genre was, like, It wasn't a marketing team, but it was created by a librarian named Margaret Scoggin in the mid-40s to uh, be part of this push to find books that would appeal to the teenage audience. In the 40s? Yeah, in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Um, Because... Wow. I feel like I didn't really... Sorry. I feel like I didn't really hear the term YA until like... I don't know, the past 10 years, but maybe that's Mm -hmm. just because YA has grown and changed so much, but it's, it felt like it was still newer to me as well, but I guess today I learned. I think it it was, it's abbreviated a lot more as YA. At the time, it was part Mm. of a, um, a newspaper art or not article, a newspaper column that she wrote and she changed it from, again, this is linked in the, uh, the description, there's a video from PBS and Lindsay Ellis, which goes over all of this. And it's really a very, very good, like thorough, uh, breakdown of YA history, but it's like, she changed the title of her column from like boys or boys books for older boys and girls or something like that to books for young adults. Um, and this was in the forties because the idea of teenagers as a thing really kind of started popping off after world war II, right? Like the idea of teenagers as a distinct cohort that can be marketed to is something that wasn't really like a concern before this. I'm kind of sad she changed it from YA though, because like the faux bag is such a fun (laughs) acronym to say. (laughs) You're right. right. (laughs) Um, So uh, publishers realized that they could market books to this audience um, and it started becoming more codified. Uh, And essentially YA for a really long time was just like buildings, Roman type books, like coming of age books. Uh, So like, Mm -hmm. you know, a little bit more serious. And then in the late nineties, we have Harry Potter and Harry Potter happens and why it blows up into what it is now, which is, and that's not to say there wasn't genre why before this one that we both enjoy very much. The Animorph series is generally considered (gasps) an early sci-fi why a, but it's still also a little bit more like middle grade. Uh, in the 90s mm. and 2000s, it starts branching out into this mega genre that encompasses all of these different subgenres. So we can kind of see that this is sort of what seems to be happening with New Adult, uh, where it starts as a marketing term and then it gets like kind of picked up by authors. And in the case of New Adult, this happened really, really quickly because it didn't super catch on with traditional publishing first. It caught on with EPUB and self pub. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like Kindle Unlimited, I feel like, is the big hub for New Adult. Yeah. Exactly, yes. So New Adult became like a term that was used by these self-publishers to describe these books that are romances set in college, usually, although some are late high school and some are post-school. Um, and they become super, super popular. Like, basically, as soon as they uh, kick off, which the New Adult boom kind of started in 2012. Mm-hmm. And generally, these have themes that are addressing issues like sexuality, 
independence and increased responsibilities. And these two especially... Losing your kind virginity. Of, yeah, losing your virginity. Um, but these, the increased responsibilities <laughs> and independence especially are kind of what uh, separates this from YA is that there is a lack of parental oversight right like in mm. ya no holds bar yeah your parents are still there you're still living at home and you're still under their control and that's often like a big part of the tension and drama is kind of like dealing with that parent-child relationship right that's not really a thing so much mm-hmm. in new adult like there might be we saw that in this book we saw that in the last book that we read too like there might be tensions between the parents and the main characters, but they aren't under the parents' control in the way that they are in young yeah. adult. So you like, have these like themes of be like relegated to a phone call. Well, yeah, <laughs> like learning to cope with your independence and like figuring out what the fuck you want to do with your life and what your career is mm-hmm. going to be and whatnot. So it is different from adult because adult is usually people who are already established. Like you already have a job and you might even already have a wife or husband, but new ad- <laughs> old adult, if you will. Yes. Old adult. The old adults already have their shit together and the new adults do not. It's essentially Seasoned what this adults. comes down to. Um, but you can also see as this adult genre prime, has- <laughs> you can see as the genres become more popular, it started branching around, branching out away from strictly romance into other genres, um, much like YA. So now that you, ha- you have like new adult authors and new adult books that are doing genre fiction. So like Sarah J. Moss, um, Jay Kristoff, uh, has a few, um, I think the, the one series you like queen of the tearling is sometimes considered a uh, new adult. Book. Oh, I love queen of the tearling and yes. it doesn't get enough recognition. Please read it. It's so good. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's still kind of up for debate as to whether new adult is a useless distinction that is just being used in order to make people feel like they have to buy a certain thing or if it is, or to buy more things, I suppose. Um, or if Mm -hmm. it is actually helpful to label books that might be in these other genres, but are relevant to the anxieties experienced by 20 somethings as they leave the safety of their childhood homes and venture out into the world at large. Um, but end of the day, it's a new genre, this new adult, and we don't really know if it's going to stick around Mm -hmm. or not, but right now, Yeah, I haven't heard as much about it lately. Yeah, so it's like, it might have been a flash in the pan. It might be on its way out. But personally, I do think that there are anxieties that are experienced by this age group that are distinct from other age groups' anxieties. I don't know if that's enough to, like, necessitate its own shelf at Barnes & Noble. But, like, (laughs) I do think it's helpful to kind of have a term to describe it. Yeah, I can see that. I, um... I don't know. To me, it's kind of like the term chiclet, which I know a mm-hmm. lot of people don't like. And maybe it's now just called women's fiction. I don't know. I'm not really, like, hip to the lingo or anything. Um, but, you know, it's it's a umbrella for what could be a bunch of different kinds of books. Yeah. But you usually know what you expect when you're getting into it. Like, you can you can – that's something you can easily search for as opposed to, like – going into Google and being like books where the main character is between the ages of 18 and 28, you know? (laughs) Right. Right. Um, but with all that being said, the book that we read this week was one of the, the earliest new adult books. It was in that push of the 2012 new adult. Um, and it's written by a pretty, I guess, prominent new adult author, Cora. I keep wanting to say Cora McCarmick, but it's just Cora Carmack, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> McCormick spices. Yeah, I think that's what I'm getting confused with. Yes. <laughs> and this book is certainly spicy. Ha, ha, ha. Got him. It's, the book is called Losing It. <laughs> yeah. So what'd you think? Um. So this book, and I said this before we started recording, um, but I'll say it again, just to be on the mm-hmm. record, was everything I expected from this genre, um, and nothing really appealed to me. <laughs> If I could be <laughs> critically honest here. Excellent. Excellent. How about you? What did you think? Um, I liked it. I thought it was a pretty typical romance. I was trying to like pinpoint the things that make it new adult. And I do think it is a pretty good example of new adult as a yes. genre. Um, I, there were definitely some stuff I had problems with, but like in terms of, 
as like, yeah, it's a, it's a romance set at college. It's fine. Yeah, it was, it was fine, but it didn't really do anything to make me excited about continuing to read this genre. Like, I'm glad mm. I tried it. Um, it was certainly better than The Mister okay. for lots of reasons, mm. uh, most of which is that it was shorter. <laughs> <laughs> And there was less sex slavery. Which yeah. Is oh, plus. yeah. I forgot about all that. <laughs> no human trafficking in this one. Just mono. Mono everywhere. <laughs> um. So who would you recommend this book to if you were to recommend it um, before we get into the, the plot? Yeah. No, I think I would. I would definitely recommend it for someone who is younger than me. I think this is a good book for... Okay. Uh, someone who's looking to kind of dip a toe into the romance genre and, like you said, isn't really into the whole, like, mm-hmm. Fabio um, covered, you know, like, mm. historic romance, the rake and the sexy lady, whatever, you know? Um, <laughs> the rake and the duchess. Yes, yes, yes. So, like, it's a cute contemporary romance. It's really quick to read, and especially if you're not familiar with romance in general or um, new adult. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing more to add. So if you are someone who is interested, couldn't possibly interested in what we're going to discuss today, now would be the point where you would pause the podcast and really quickly read the book and then come back to hear us talk about it and possibly shit on it a yeah. little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's had. I will say, I think that like, this was a really good book for me for this podcast, because like I said, there's definitely stuff that I was like, this is dumb and stupid and I'm going to make fun of it. But like, I overall enjoyed the book. It wasn't the most offensive thing we've read for this podcast, for sure. Mm. Well, that's a that's a very, very low bar to not be the most offensive thing. This is I mean, true. It is no... Uh... It wasn't Save the Pearls. Like... Yeah, that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's just get into the meat of this book and talk about what it was about. Yes. And so Bliss is a senior in college, majoring in theater, and also a virgin. Ooh. Oh, no. She tells this fact to her BFF, Kelsey, who is like, girl, we got to get you late immediately. So they go to this bar called Stumble Inn, which was a bar that we had in Columbus when I was in college. <laughs> so I was like, cool. Um, and... They're gonna go. They go with the goal of trying to pick up a guy for Bliss, and she runs into Garrick, a hottie with a body and a British accent, reading Shakespeare in the back of a college bar, like a super cool guy. <laughs> okay, so we got to talk about we got to talk about a couple things in this first scene already, which I would have interrupted already, except that my Kindle was loading because I accidentally had it open to the wrong thing, um, and mm. I was like, "Huh, this isn't what I how I remember this book going." Oh, it's a different book. That's why. Um, <laughs> First off, Bliss Edwards' name is insane and definitely influenced by Twilight, number one. Yes. Number two, I really like the part where it was, like, her getting ready for going to this bar. Her friend's like, your outfit isn't slutty enough. You need to change. And she, like, checks her outfit, and it's, like, a, an A-line skirt and a tank that shows some cleavage. Yes. And, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. her friend's like, you look like a... You look like a someone's little sister. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, it's a skirt and a tank top. Like, because it's A-line. I, I don't think A-line is particularly, like, childish, no. right? Like, but I was like, that's weird. But I guess they're going to get her into, like, some, like, leather pants <laughs> and, like, bustier. And that's it. Nothing else. Nope. You know, like. Denim capris. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, okay. It's, it's literally... It says some tight, low-rise denim capris and a lacy black tank top. And it's like, okay, you are already wearing a tank top, though. Yeah. Why is this? Because it has lace on it? And you're wearing, you're capris. wearing denim capris. I, That's not sexy. What no, are you talking about? I had to Google. I was like, okay, denim capris 2019. And then I was like, oh, no, this was, like, mm-hmm. way before then. So then I had to Google denim capris 20, 2012. And either way, like, mm-hmm. that's not something you wear with the intent of, like, going out to get some D. <laughs> that's, like, what you wear to, like, a Sunday brunch with your grandmother. Yes. Because, like, it's hot out. 
and your grandmother is like very conservative and doesn't want to see your knees like <laughs> just the ankles <laughs> just ankles only and even that is a little offensive yes you better be wearing some socks folded down your little your white <laughs> cotton socks and some tennies <laughs> uh, Jesus, but yeah so she meets this guy at the bar and he's as you said reading Shakespeare which gets into like this really awesome conversation about if Shakespeare's good or not which like what the fuck it's, ever he, it's not <laughs> <laughs> well at least it wasn't Romeo and Juliet I just want to be like there are other playwrights out there and I know that like Shakespeare is kind of the signal mm-hmm. for like whoa English nerd alert but like right come on guys but she like gets turned on by the fact it's Shakespeare and that's upsetting that's really weird to me I feel like she had a hard on for Willie yes I feel like a lot of times these like when books are trying to signal that someone's super smart they're like they really love this one author, this one old timey author, and they just really love this one. And it's mm-hmm. like, no, people aren't generally like, even if you are an English lit nerd and really like reading old shit for whatever fucking reason, like you're not going to be like, I just love Shakespeare and only Shakespeare. And Correct. I haven't read any of his contemporaries, I guess. <laughs> um, so that was weird. But then, like you said, it's not Romeo and Juliet. Instead, her favorite play is Othello. And then we get treated to like this really cool, super great conversation about whether or not Desdemona deserved getting murdered. Yeah. (laughs) Complete with just like quotes all over the place. Yes. But like Garrick is like, sometimes I think Desdemona wasn't as innocent as she led on. And it's like, based on what? (laughs) Like having read Othello Based on what? Like, what are you talking about? And then she's like... The fact that Bliss was wearing capris and a lacy tank top. Not as innocent as she would have wanted to come off. Yes. And the bartender was flirting with her. And so that made Garrick jealous. And he's like, ooh, maybe she's trying to make me jealous. But then, like, she says something about, like, oh, communication is key. Uh, It would have solved a lot of their problems if Desdemona had just communicated. And it's like, no opposite guys it's opposite it's othello who was bad at communication what are you guys reading why are we blaming desdemona for getting murdered what is it was all her fault honestly she was asking for it she shouldn't have been wearing the sexy capris that's why her husband murdered her i know honestly that's like the number one reason that women were killed back in the day is because their denim capris were too sexy Mm -hmm. right (laughs) Uh, oh, man. anyway, Garrick and Bliss hit it off immediately and start making out at the bar. And Garrick's like, let's go back to my place. And so they get on his little motorcycle. And guess what? They live in the same apartment complex, just a building over from each other. Which to me, this is nightmare territory. This is oh where God, I'm like, yes. no, I'm, I'm good, actually. I'd be like, actually, we can't do this anymore because I'm going to have to see you probably most days of the week afterwards whether or not we continue this relationship yeah i'd be like oh if this doesn't go well you can fully desdemona me like you have the (laughs) ability because you live next door (laughs) but i guess to her credit she was gonna keep it quiet until she burned her leg up real bad so Mm. she like as she's getting off garrick's motorcycle i guess she just like presses her leg up on the exhaust pipe um and yeah in her denim capris in her denim capris that must have been coverage. shorter than i thought they were treading into bermuda short territory which whew, watch out <laughs> see this did, this made perfect sense to me as a tall person because i was like yeah of course capris barely cover your knees if that <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like wow how much skin was there even there to be burned because my capris go to right above my ankle <laughs> so Instead of getting sexy at Garrick's apartment, she's like, Owie, take me home to my place so we can treat my burn. And they do, and some clothes come off, and they're having a very sexy se- and they're having a very sexy situation in her bed with some kissing and petting. A sexy situation. Necking. <laughs> but this is great. Bliss freaks out in the middle of this session and Instead of telling Garrick she is a virgin, which would have been a totally fine and appropriate thing to do, she lies and says she has to go pick up her cat, which she doesn't have, 
at a 24-hour emergency vet clinic um, at midnight. And she rushes out of her apartment wearing no shoes, socks, or shirt. And then just hides behind some trash cans or something until she sees Garrick leave her apartment, which <laughs> takes him 10 minutes to do. Okay, and you said, like, instead of just telling him that she was a virgin, it's like... Yes. That's one option. She could have been mature and been like, hey, I haven't done this before. Like, let's slow down. I'm a little freaked out. Let's slow it down for a second. That's one yeah. option. Another option would have been to, because she's like, I have to tell him this thing. It's like, you could have just not, is the That's thing. True, true. You could have just not told him. Because, like, virginity is kind of a made-up thing anyway. And, like, you're 22. Your hymen's probably busted from riding on that motorcycle. Like, <laughs> you just broke okay. it right then. You lost uh, your virginity to that motorcycle. <laughs> you didn't know. Pretty unlikely that, like, he they're going to do it. And she's just going to start bleeding all over the place. Mm-hmm. So, like, she could have just not told him. I mean, like, that's not ideal in terms of being super open and whatever but this is kind of the ideal if you are trying to lose your virginity very true like, this guy is raring to go yeah he, he thinks he thinks you're drunk anyway a, a Which, little drunk not yeah. like creepy <laughs> levels but so if like you do start like just bleeding out and he's like fuck you're a virgin you can be like oh yeah i totally forgot to mention because i'm a little bit drunk and it's not gonna be a big deal yeah. like or third option why are you <laughs> third option she could have just been like hey we just met. Let's not do PNV. Let me give you a handy instead. Like, <laughs> right. And that was, that was the thing that I really missed from this book because it was like this big deal that she was a virgin and whatever. Uh-huh. And of course that's spoiler alert. That's what it's leading up to is eventually she's no longer a virgin in this book. She's losing it. Like it doesn't really address the fact that you can do other stuff. Besides yes. If you're like anxious about that one thing, like, Maybe, I don't know. I thought that that might be what this book ended up being was like a bunch of sex scenes of like, okay, she learns to Me give him a hand too, like, job and she up to gives it. him a blow job and she gets eaten out. Like, yes. But it's just like, nah. Garrick doesn't orgasm until the end of this book. Right. And neither does she, right? Like, she's. Yeah, I don't think so. I think. So I don't know. I'm just like, I don't know. Maybe like address in any way the fact that like virginity isn't this big, huge deal. Like, it is and it isn't. Like, it's, like, it's a big deal to, like, be intimate with someone for the first time, but it's, like, the actual, like, emphasis on P and V as, like, this threshold that cannot be uncrossed. Like, who cares? And that's why I I had such a huge problem with the friend Kelsey because there's just, like, a couple Mm -hmm. of instances in this book where she tries to force her lifestyle and her ideologies on Bliss. I'm just, like, if you were really a friend, like, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Like, you wouldn't, uh, uh, the the yeah. first thing that would occur to you after your friend's like, hey, I'm still a virgin, shouldn't be, let's undo that. <laughs> right. Or, like, if your friend doesn't want to go out dancing and you force her to go out dancing with you and then you get mad because when you get to the bar she doesn't want to dance, like, that's stupid too. <laughs> or, like, if your friend's like, I'm still a virgin and you're like, let's fix it, which that's, like a buck wild thing to think yeah. is like, we need to fix your virginity. Like that's weird. But, um, and then your friend is like, I don't know. I'm just not really interested in any guys and be like, what are you gay? Like, okay, <sighs> cool. <laughs> Super cool. Number one, if she is, maybe don't call her out on it yeah. like that. Cause she probably wants to come out in her own time. Number two, if she's not like, there's a lot of other reasons that one could not want to have sex with people aside from the gender thing. It could be, Because she doesn't want to get pregnant and she's, like, nervous about birth control. It could be, like, she just doesn't feel like it. She could be asexual. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't know and you're, like, making these weird assumptions about it. Kelsey was a terrible friend. Kelsey was not good at all and I didn't like her. I think that that was kind of one of the things about this whole book is the whole time I just wanted to be, like, who the fuck cares about any of this? Like, just (laughs) have sex with him or not. Like, I understand the hesitation once we find out who Garrick is. But before then, just do or don't. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> fine well and honestly i thought this was going to be in that direction because she's like she keeps saying stuff and i shouldn't have expected this because it was 2012 and this wouldn't have been a thing at the time but like mm-hmm. not like that it wasn't a thing but this wouldn't have been in a super popular romance book that kicked off a genre at 
in 2012, you know, um, mm-hmm. that I thought that uh, Bliss was asexual because she kept like mm. saying stuff like, oh, I I like the idea of no longer being a virgin, but I don't want to have sex. Yeah. Like, so it's like, I don't she's, like that loss of control. Yeah. Or just, she's like not interested in it. She like a yeah. lot of time. And I, I get that what this ends up being is she just needs the right guy, which is also bonkers. <laughs> yes. But like, I don't know, especially in this scene where it's like, she's making out with this guy who she is attracted to, but then she's like, oh no, I just don't want to do this, which is fine. But it's like, I don't know. I felt like, I, I guess I felt like it was promoting this idea that women or, and I guess Kelsey's kind of meant to be like the anti this so that she's slutty. Cause she has big boobs. Um, <laughs> well, no, I'm saying that like Kelsey's supposed to be like, Oh, it's fine to go out and have sex and have fun. Oh, and yeah. bliss is like, it's also fine to not do that. And to she want not a good an ally. intimate connection with your partner. Right. And it's like, those things are both fine, but the way that bliss is written, it didn't, it didn't seem to me like bliss was waiting for the right guy for most of this book. It seemed like she just wasn't interested in that at all. Like she She just just wanted to make it. It wasn't on her radar. Right. And that's completely valid. Yeah. Kelsey's trash. Uh, so the next day bliss lies to kelsey about having sex with garrick which is very cool good friends yes it's the first day of class guess who their new theater teacher is the new adjunct in the theater department is garrick oh my god because of course these nerds are theater majors exactly as a former theater kid i was like oh man i lived these hijinks in high school and even then i was like wow we are insufferable and i need to stop behaving in this (laughs) manner (laughs) stop behaving in that manner post high school but like Uh uh-huh it i will say the theater kids in this book although they are theater majors in college not theater high schoolers but they are exactly as terrible as i expect theater kids to be oh yeah it felt it felt very authentic to me but again like I would have authentic in a high school setting, not a college setting. Mm. No, I mean, I still think it's authentic because I think that college theater majors are very similar to high school theater kids. I think it's just the ones that don't grow out of that. Like, Oh, we're a found family and I'm so quirky and weird. And we're going to, I'm going to sing music man in public. Yes. Like we're going to behave in ways that are like socially awkward and like kind of rude to other people around you. Like there's a scene where they're all at the bar and she's like, we all didn't care that we were being incredibly rude to the other patrons and yelling across the bar. We did it anyway. I'm like, okay, so you know, you're terrible. Like we're just in theater. (laughs) We're so quirky. The muses move us. Like, okay, chill the fuck out. (laughs) I just have a personality that belongs on the stage. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) Bliss and Garrick have a little freak out. They're like, oh man, we gotta keep things kind of professional. Let's just forget it happened. Okay. But, you know, they still are like, our eyes met and the air around us sizzled. So... Y'all know how well that's going to go. There was a lot of eye-related talking in this one where it's like our eyes met and I felt that he wanted this. I'm like, I have never, ever looked any other human being in the eyes and been able to get like any sort of besides like maybe they're angry or maybe they're like (laughs) horny. Like that's pretty much it. Like anything aside from that. You're going to need to, like, say words. Maybe I'm just stupid. I don't know. You need to talk louder with your eyes. (laughs) Oh, my God. Really? Em, I didn't know that about you. Wow. Those are some expressive (laughs) eyes. And you got the brows in there, too? That's a whole nother level. (laughs) Very good for our audio format. (laughs) Your eyes, Garrick, your eyes say come hither, but your eyebrows say stay away. (laughs) i'm so confused garrick what do i do (laughs) just have sex it's fine well not anymore now that he's your teacher you guys shouldn't have sex which this is a good boundary (laughs) but can we talk about for a second the fact that garrick garrick okay garrick (laughs) 
who <laughs> Garrick. Um, I don't know where exactly they're supposed to be in Texas, so I don't know if it's like a big city or if it's just supposed to be a small college town. But I got the vibe that it was like it's a pre- like he's on campus when they first yes. meet, right? Like it's like a bar yes. near campus, and he is a teacher at that school at this point. It's like I get that he thought that she was older. Because of, like, the one thing that she said that kind of implied that she might have already graduated, but not really. I feel like it is part of your responsibility as any type of professor, if you are at a bar that you know is, and he knows this because he went to school there. If you're at a bar that is typically inhabited by college students, you need to do your due diligence and make sure that you're not about to fuck a college student especially one that's in yes. your class and also Very true. he fully he fully had the class roster at this time and i'm not saying you should know every single person in your class but like <laughs> but he glanced bliss. at that and saw there was a bitch named bliss <laughs> like a hundred percent you cannot <laughs> tell me that he didn't notice there was a yes. bitch named bliss in his class and then he goes to a college bar on a college campus at the college he's teaching at and meets someone named Bliss and isn't like, oh, wait, pump the brakes. <laughs> Hold on. This must be a really popular name now in this part of Texas. There's lots of Blisses right. running around. <laughs> so many Blisses. <laughs> oh, so blissful. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so Bliss has another best friend named Cade. Who is a guy, which I didn't realize for like an embarrassing length of time. (laughs) I was like, cool, they're going to like, and I don't know if I just like glazed over the pronouns or what, but I was like, wow, they're having like this female friendship that maybe they're going to like delve into a non-heterosexual relationship, but no. You idiot. You absolute dumbass. (laughs) (laughs) No, I thought I was <laughs> almost certain that um, Cade was going to be gay because I was like, this is mm, a stereotypical too. gay theater major. Um, so, I mean, like, I was pleasantly surprised that he wasn't actually. But then I was unpleasantly surprised that this was leading to a dumb, stupid love triangle that was nothing and went nowhere. It was the only reason he wasn't gay. <laughs> right. Um. So the two of them go out to get coffee together And, of course, they run into Garrick, who assumes the two of them are dating, but this isn't revealed until, like, a little bit later in the book when he's being all possessive over Bliss, even though he and Bliss are in a relationship, and it's just very gross. Also, it wasn't revealed, but it was also super obvious because it was, like, Cade was, like, all over Bliss all the time, and it's, like, yeah, obviously, if you saw that, you would be, like, oh, this is a couple. They behave exactly like a couple, despite not being a couple for Reasons. Yeah, they do a lot of kissing for people who are just best friends. Kissing which, on the forehead. Yeah, that's an intimate one. Like kissing on the cheek, okay. Yeah. Especially if you're saying hello or goodbye. I can get beyond that, but forehead kisses are very special. Forehead kisses, I'm pretty sure the only people that I would kiss on the forehead outside of a like sexual relationship would be like a small child who has hurt themselves mm-hmm. on the forehead by running into a wall, number one. Mm-hmm. And number two, my dying mentor who has been shot by, like, seven arrows from, like, the attacking Oh, my orcs, God, yes. And now they're, like, laying they're and dying, dying in your and arms. they're, like, giving me some... Mm-hmm, oh. And they're giving me, like, some victory speech, like, you need to keep fighting. And I'm, like, I will fight on yes. for you. And then I forehead kiss them as they die. <laughs> That's pretty much it. And I the rain starts ever... pouring. Yes. 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 And then I shoot the orcs because of and course. And you're like, you're yeah. like I'll avenge you, sensei. <laughs> well, we're, we're mixing our media there a little bit, I think. It's a, it's a fantasy anime. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> That's the only time forehead kisses are permissible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Sorry. No, I just like have this metal image then of like the character stands up and they do that like shoulder shaking thing and the bad guy's like, ha ha ha, they're crying, but actually you're laughing and then you turn around and you kill the bad guy. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) It's become a whole thing in my head now. (laughs) Uh, So after getting coffee, Cade goes to drop Bliss off at her apartment, but his car won't start. 
And Garrick sees this, and the decision is made that Cade will walk home because he lives real close by because he still lives on campus as a senior in college. Well, he's an RA. Oh, okay. I totally missed that part. I was like, why would you choose to live in expensive on-campus housing? (laughs) Nah, free housing, man. (laughs) Uh, But Garrett gives Bliss a ride home, and then they say goodnight. Like, nothing happens. This scene was kind of stupid. I just included it in the summary because Cade, I had to introduce him. (laughs) Okay. I don't typically like to ship non-canon ships because I generally am like, well, whatever the characters want is should Mm. be... Like I'm not saying like non-canon ships like like if the if the character is in a canon ship by the end of the book I'm like their choice should be respected even though they're fictional right <laughs> so mm-hmm. generally I like to ship whatever ship ends up being the one that sails okay but I was really kind of like it should be Kate and Bliss right like this yeah book should be this Kate should and be Bliss. a boy next door romance not a hot for teacher one like the boy next door who supports you through your really shitty and ill-advised fling with your drama teacher <laughs> oh yike <sighs> poor Kate. this is definitely one of those books where i was like i'm okay with the relationship because it is in her point of view and i know that she does want it but like mm-hmm. if it was not if it was like third person or something i would be super grossed out by it because yeah. like he needs to chill Yes, Garrick is so, like, he he aggressively pursues Bliss throughout this, even though she has several times said, I don't want Mm. this, I want it to stay professional. And Garrick just completely ignores her at some points and just, like, kisses her in public when she's she's definitely uncomfortable about it. Garrick was not great. I think we're about to get to it, the scene where they're doing, like, uh, practice auditions. Yes, yes. She's partnered with this guy who's like a big jerk type guy. And during the scene, the jerk guy decides to like start kit because it's from Streetcar Named Desire. Mm -hmm. And it's the pre-rape scene. And the guy decides to just start making out with Bliss on stage, Mm -hmm. which Bliss is like not cool with. And wasn't expecting. So Garrick, who's their teacher... Uh, pulls the other guy off of her and is like don't you never should do that without checking first like you need to talk to your scene partner you can't just do shit like that and I was like yeah good a discussion about consent excellent and then like Uh uh-huh maybe Dom will learn but probably not the scene after that like Garrick is like kisses her without asking or checking to make sure if it's cool and I'm like yes okay (laughs) do you not get that the thing that you just said about like Doing this in a play also applies to real life. Like, <laughs> Practice what you preach, Garrick. But it's okay because he, he loves her or he will grow to love her and he really wants to have sex with her. So it's fine, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Uh, but Bliss breaks off the kiss and they again promise to keep things professional. <laughs> mm. Wink. Mm. Not. So anyway, their play that year, or the the semester, is the Greek tragedy Phaedra, which um, from the little this book told me about it, and I was too lazy to look it up, is the story of a woman who falls in love with her stepson. And Bliss is able to channel a ton of this, like, forbidden love energy into her audition, and she lands the part. She's like, no one else is even considered. It is just hers. Callbacks? Uh -uh, (laughs) Uh-uh. Not for Bliss. (laughs) Um, and the male role has some callbacks and she has to like go and help out with them. But eventually Cade lands the lead role for the male, not the step. The, no, it is the stepson. Yeah. He gets the stepson's role. Yeah. But anyway, before that's all decided in order to celebrate auditions being over, the theater kids go out to a bar and get absolutely wasted, which is the scene where <laughs> Em was talking about, they were just like yelling and disrupting everyone else and all the other patrons. It was fine. And on the way home, well, actually, <laughs> I meant to mention this in the beginning and I totally forgot, but like the amount of alcohol they drink in each of these like drinking sessions is alarming to me. And maybe Mm -hmm. I just don't remember what college is like, but in the first scene, when they go to the bar for bliss to find someone to have sex with, she immediately takes four shots of tequila and then drinks two Jack and Cokes all in the space of like, maybe 30 minutes to an hour. I don't know. It was all very like, and I'm just like, girl, 
you that's not conducive to having sex like you are gonna go home with someone who is not safe for you but luckily the story isn't written that way but like that's dangerous (laughs) yeah and i mean like like you said i don't know maybe it's just like i don't really remember being like that young and having that i'm I'm acting like i'm in my 50s i'm 28 but like i don't remember (laughs) you know when i was of a drinking like going out and drinking lifestyle which I wasn't ever really like super into but you and it know. was still exciting to do and not yeah like occasionally a hangover waiting to happen yeah right like I don't I never I don't think I ever drank that much that quickly like definitely I would you know like four shots to mix drinks over the course of a party that's normal I feel mm-hmm. like uh, but like four shots, two mixed drinks in the course of 30 minutes, like girlfriend should be on the floor. Like maybe I just have a low tolerance. Honestly, I was like, how is she still walking and carrying on a conversation about Othello? Like <laughs> what's going on? Like, I wonder if this is somewhat <laughs> just like bias narrator where like, this is what, cause there is a part in that first bit where when she gets on the motorcycle, she just starts like reciting Shakespeare. And I assumed when she said, Oh, when yeah. she said that she meant like she was thinking it in her head, but then he's like, oh, he like comments on it. He's like, oh, you really do like Shakespeare, huh? So like maybe she is a lot more wasted than it seems. <laughs> the whole conversation was actually, I read Shakespeare. This is not, she's real cool. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to your place, scare. But that also... <laughs> puts a very negative light on Garrick. So he was super into it. He bought her another drink. Mm-hmm. He was like, we need to get Keep me more going. alcohol into you girl. Which is why I was like, he seems again, because of the way it wraps up and because it's from her perspective, I'm like, he's fine. I can buy him as a romantic hero. But if this was told to me, if someone recounted this to me, like from if like Kelsey came to me and was like, so me and my friend Bliss went to the bar last night. We got there. She's looking to hook up with a guy. Um, she did like four shots and like two two Jack and Cokes, and um, she ran into this guy. He bought her another drink, and um, they went home together. Oh, it turns out he's a professor. I'd be like, "What the fuck? Like, what the fuck, Kelsey? You should have stopped." Why this. did you let Bliss go with him? He puts. What are you doing? You're a terrible friend. Bad friend. He was preying on her for sure. Oh my god, yeah. Kelsey's not good. No, Kelsey needs to be stopped. <laughs> Hashtag Kelsey did everything wrong. Kelsey was the worst. Uh, So they go out and get like super wasted again. Hours and hours of drinking. And on the way home, they run into Garrick. I guess he's just wandering the streets at 2 a.m. I don't know why they ran into him. Um, Because they stayed until last call. I think they're like getting out at her apartment and he lives at his, at the apartment. So I think like they were being loud and he came out to see. Oh, I thought... I misread it. I thought he just like wandered over to them, like just on the way between. He was like going somewhere and then turned around and went back with them. I didn't understand. Anyway, apparently they got home and Garrick was there. They were like outside of her apartment and he was like outside of his apartment. Probably because they were being fucking loud and he was like, what's going on? Like, probably. (laughs) Oh, sounds like those theater kids. Um, He (laughs) helps escort Bliss home because she's extremely drunk. And then she's like, stay with us and drink, which (laughs) even if you weren't interested in sleeping with your teacher, like, that's such a weird thing to ask a teacher. Why would he want to stay and get drunk with his students? (laughs) Uh, Um, But then the theater kids all decide to play spin the bottle because, of course, they do. And they're all making out with each other, which will become important later. Yes. To be clear, Garrick does not take her up on the offer. He does dip. He doesn't stay to party. Oh, yeah. He's like, no, gotta go. <laughs> you guys are really annoying right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, hmm, let me see. Do I want to hang out with a bunch of drunk theater majors? No, thanks. I'm good. I did this. One of which is underage. Mm. Like, mm. <laughs> that could get you into a little bit of trouble as a teacher. Maybe. He's like, no, this is, I will get fired. Uh, so the important thing that happens this night is that Cade and Bliss kiss. And it is very intense on Cade's part i think bliss is probably just like drunk but um the next morning like everyone comments up like "Ooh, get a room Ooh. then the next morning kate admits that he has feelings for bliss and she isn't sure how she feels so she's like maybe someday i will also have feelings for you <laughs> and things are very awkward from then on i will say i think that the whole i i 
I was okay with how this was handled, I think, because I think that Mm -hmm. it was pretty realistic that Bliss was like, I am not really sure how I feel because you just sprang this on me. Like, I was like, that's fair. That's a fair point. Um, you, you would have to go think about it probably unless you were like in love yeah, and you knew yeah. that and you were secretly pining, which she's not. So like, that's a fair point to be like, I got to think about this. Um, and I also think it was fair that when bliss was mm-hmm. essentially like, well, I, this is getting a little ahead, but when bliss was like, I'm taking back my, maybe I don't want to like be a romantic couple with you that he was like, that's cool. I don't really want to hang out then. Cause like, I am in love with you, and that yeah. would be painful. Because, like, I get that that could be read as a little bit friend zone but I feel like friend zone generally is more like a guy becomes friends with a girl specifically in order to get in her pants and then is, like, annoyed when she doesn't want that. Mm-hmm. And I felt like in this it was like... Why can't I ascend? Right. Like, I feel like this was more like they were friends, Cade developed feelings, she wasn't into it, and Cade mm-hmm. was like... I need to do what's best for me, which unfortunately means I can't hang out with you right now. Cause like it sucks for me. And I think that everybody was yes. pretty respectful of others feelings, but then it like blew up into all this drama. And I was like, why? Yes. That was my issue is like, they handled it maturely in the moment. And then like, as soon as he had some time to like reflect on it, he got pissed. Mm-hmm. And then somehow and he must have, like gone around and talked shit to everybody else yes and we know it wasn't bliss because we're inside her head so Cade went and was like telling everybody bliss guess what doesn't love me let's all be mad at her and everyone takes Cade's side which like bullshit right. he's the one that sprang these feelings on her why is she also to blame just because she whatever piss me off <laughs> maybe maybe Cade didn't tell everybody else maybe bliss told kelsey and kelsey told everybody else because Kelsey's the worst. Probably, probably. Kelsey's like, listen, this bitch that didn't go dancing with me, <laughs> guess what she did? Uh, <laughs> but before that happens, Garrick tells Bliss that he doesn't care that he's her teacher and he wants to pursue a relationship with her, which... Okay. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like, she has said she doesn't want to... Whatever. I'm not entirely creeped out by this because i'm like okay they are consenting adults she's 22 and he's like what 26 or something like that i think so like it's not like there's a huge age gap they're both adults they it's not like they've had a long-standing like power dynamic going on i guess so she, he just started teaching her recently they knew each other they technically knew each other before she found out he was teacher like so it's not like oh i've been teaching you since you were a freshman and now you're almost about to graduate and I want to get with you or something like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't the worst use of this trope of like hot for teacher. Um, But there still are power dynamics at play, I think. Yes. And I think my problem with hot for teacher is always just the fact that my husband is a college professor. And so all of these things are gross. It's not great. Get your grubby hands off my man. (laughs) You new adult. He doesn't want new. He wants season prime adult. <laughs> so Garrick is going to come over for dinner that night to talk about this relationship he wants to be in with Bliss. And so she's like, shit, I got to go adopt that cat that I told him I had. So she goes to get a cat and she takes, because t- she still doesn't want to reveal that she's a virgin. She doesn't want to be like, as much as, like, the virgin thing is stupid, I really did appreciate the hijinks in this book. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad she followed through and wasn't just like, oh, my cat died. But no, she actually went and she got a cat, which is, right. you know, for cat life. She didn't, she didn't, like, give him back after the story was over. Yeah. But, yeah, she doesn't want to reveal that she's a virgin. So she goes and she adopts an animal to take care of when she's already so terrible at taking care of herself, it seems like. But Kate tags along and... While adopting the cat, she tells Kay that she takes back her maybe because she doesn't have feelings for him. And in fact, she has feelings for someone else. And then he gets upset and begins to ignore her because it hurts too much to be around her, which we already went over. And then apparently he went and talked shit. So whatever. (laughs) Garrett goes over to Bliss's house that evening for dinner. And he didn't ask her what she wanted for dinner. So he brings pizza and a burger and salad. (laughs) Just like. No, that's that's relatable. I like that. I'm into that. You like, (laughs) listen, I've, I've 
long stated that my modus operandi when I go to a fast food place is to go and order two meals and just get two drinks with it so I can pretend that I'm taking it home to somebody else to share. And really, it's just for me. <laughs> or like when I order food, uh-huh. I'll like definitely get like, because I like having options. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, so do you like eat half of each meal and then save the other halves for later yeah like I won't like down them both right at that second like I'll definitely save some for later but yeah. like no I'm like not trying to out you or food shame you <laughs> no you can it's fine I'm a garbage person um no or like if people if I'm ordering food I'll do the thing where I like pretend that there are other people in my home to justify the number of pizzas I've gotten do you give like unnecessary information yeah I've just got like three friends over and their names are Steve Greg and Lisa and they're and they all like really different things on their pizzas so these are the ones I want (laughs) no but I'll be like like I'll open the door and like be like oh hey what's up and then like I'll like look over my shoulder and like do a little like nod like yeah yeah I'm getting the pizzas to like an invisible person who's not there (laughs) I love it (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, hold on I'll be right back (laughs) good joke yeah yeah hold on pizza guy (laughs) or if the pizza guy is like oh like set engages me in any sort of conversation and I'm like if they're like oh yeah, got your food hot and fresh for you. I'll be like, oh yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. You got our tip, right? (laughs) Me and my 30 best friends back here. (laughs) Would you like their names? I can give you their names. (laughs) My raging but silent party. (laughs) It's one of those silent dance parties where we're all listening to the same song in our headphones. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I appreciated Garrick's move here. I think it was the right call. (laughs) <laughs> I just don't I feel like the burger would have been in a bad state at that point though I'm just imagining like soggy bun I do feel like it's weird that he must have gone to different restaurants right because it's like yes. pizza yeah. yes salad yes it should have been like pizza pasta and salad should have been the thing and that would have made yes. sense but like that the burger sense. is a yeah. bit of an outlier <laughs> Unless he was like DoorDash, Grubhub, and Uber Eats all rolled up at the same time from all the different places he told them to get some food. <laughs> and then he made them fight for their tip. Yes. He just he just threw like 20 singles out the door. I was like, go get it. <laughs> Scramble for it, plebes. I'm going to go fuck my student. <laughs> <laughs> it makes him feel big and strong. <laughs> Oh, man. I like that Garrick much better than I like real Garrick. Soft boy Garrick. Yeah. So they end up talking and making out and start having a se- start having a secret relationship that consists of just sneaking over to each other's apartments and having dinner. And Bliss is like, we have to go slow because I don't want to tell you I'm a virgin. So they do. All they do is kiss. And, like, Garrick takes her so literally that he even, like, kisses her slowly. Like, he won't he won't kiss with any passion. He's just like... Which, I don't know what that means. I don't know. Like, like I, I imagine, like, just mouth to mouth, no tongue. Well, because just they like, keep mm-hmm. saying slow. Like, the pace is actually slow. So I'm just like, is he just, like, gradually smooshing his, like, lips across her lips? Like, rolling his... <laughs> What are you talking about? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and like I get, I get oh in romance God. novels when they say like, oh, they move slow or they move, you know, like move fast, like in a general sense. But when it's like applied to a very specific movement, it's like a kiss is a kiss. Like I don't know how much you can slow that down without it being comical. Yeah. <laughs> Without <laughs> just smearing your lips on somebody. Right. Like, at what point is it no longer a kiss and it is, like, just headbutting? Like, at what point? Is it, <laughs> is it headbutting with your chin? Like, what's... When, it, when does it become... We mashed our bodies together in a right. languid motion. <laughs> oh, my God. Um... Stupid filler stuff happens, but the important thing is the rehearsals for the play are going terribly because things are super awkward between Kate and Bliss. Um, 
And so Bliss walks in on Garrick reprimanding Cade for not being able to put his feelings for Bliss aside for the sake of acting. And Bliss gets all pissy with Garrick for butting into her business. (laughs) For the craft. (laughs) And and the two of them just kind of break up in front of Cade, but like on the DL with very loaded phrases that aren't like, we're breaking up. On the worst DL ever because Cade immediately goes, oh, that was the guy you were dating? (laughs) Yes. And then he promises not to tell anybody. Which. <laughs> so after that, rehearsals go a little bit better because I guess like Caden Bliss coming to an understanding of like, let's try to work on being friends again because this sucks and we were always friends first. And we work really well as friends. Um, So they, they try to work on it and rehearsals go a little bit better. But then one of the cast members announces that he has mono. And basically everyone that played Spin the Bottle is at risk of getting mono including Bliss, which then extends to Garrick because they make out. I am not lying. This was my favorite part of this book. This entire like segment from the twist of, oh no, everybody has mono. I was like, excellent. Yes, this is perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. And then through, because I thought it was going to be, that was going to be how it was revealed was like Garrick got mono. And then like the, the professor of their department was like, wait, how did you get mono from these children? Which like, one of them did you kiss? It didn't go that way, but it did also go into a different direction, which is my one of my absolute favorite romance tropes, which might have been the thing that took this book from me being like, eh, it's fine, to being like, no, I enjoyed this book, which is nursing a sick person and the sick person is in love with you, but they don't know that you love them back. There's a lot of just like the sick mm. person being like, oh, I, I must be delirious. He'd never care for me in this way. Like, it's so stupid and so choice. Yes. I love it so much. I wish much. he was really here and not just a figment of not my a, imagination. A fever dream. <laughs> uh, some sick hallucination. This is like a good way to get the stakes up without the stakes actually being up. And also it's like a fun way to show them caring for each other in a non-sexual way because it's like... Nobody wants to make out with someone who's puking. So, like, they must really like each other. A hundred percent. Yes, it was true love. So, yeah, I guess what? Bliss gets mono and I guess passes out outside of her apartment. And so Garrett goes to take care of her. And then he gets mono. He's taking care of her. And so she nurses him back to health. And then the two of them are just, like, very sick together for a whole week. Chef's kiss. (laughs) Chef's kiss. (laughs) I thought that i don't know i feel like it was a little bit too cheesy for me in this instance of mono i don't know no i loved it i have absolutely no complaints about this part of the book it's like everybody's allowed to have a couple of those right like romance tropes in general are cheesy right yeah that's true okay like the shared bed like oh we got a hotel room and uh uh-oh there's only one bed we have to share it I always think that usually comes across as cheesy, but I know that a lot of people really like that trope. This is that trope for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just like, look, I get that it's cheesy, but I just love when people take care of sick people. I don't know. Maybe I have like a nightingale fetish or something. Like, I don't know, but I just love when sick people take care of each other (laughs) in in romance. You should be a candy striper. Mm. During the war, you've missed your calling. You're born in the wrong decade. That was like a, a one of the plot lines in Sex in the City, right? Where like uh, Mr. Big has a heart attack and then she's like has to take care of him. And that's when I was oh. like on board with that. <laughs> them the most. I was like, yes, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Love that shit now. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, the mono helps bring them back together. Mm-hmm. because they weren't talking for like it was like a month or two i think they weren't talking but the mono the mono did its work and they fall in love again and bliss finally admits that she is a virgin and garrick was like Whew, i thought i was going crazy because i thought there was something you thought that was wrong with me and that's why you didn't want to have sex with me because it was something wrong with me <laughs> just like you guys are so dumb <laughs> <laughs> And anyway, it's resolved. <laughs> Opening out of the play is pushed back a week because everyone is sick. But when it does finally open, Bliss acts her little heart out and she gives the best performance of her life. And also she loses her virginity to Garrick that night and they have a sex. <laughs> and Bliss says, I'm thinking about moving to Philly after college because that's 
where you lived before you came here to teach and you still have an apartment there for some reason. And <laughs> right? um, you told Why? me it was a good place to go if I wanted to be into theater, but not go all the way to New York, because I guess maybe I'm just not that good. <laughs> I, I appreciate that level of realism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, maybe not New York or LA, but like Philly? That's a good in between. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he says that we'll move in together. So they do. And then epilogue is six months later. Bliss has a lead role, and she's Elizabeth Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. Garrick is playing Mr. Bingley. And basically, he just plans to propose to her sometime in the near future. But because I guess Bliss likes to overthink things, and he doesn't want her to freak out if and when he does propose, he hides the ring in a place that he knows Bliss is going to look. And then she sees it, and she's like, oh my god. And she's like silently freaking out and doing a dance and stuff. And he's like, yay, that means she wants to marry me too. (laughs) Which like, okay. You could have just talked about it. (laughs) (laughs) Like here's, here's one option. You can hide the ring in a place and then have an elaborate like cert because it's not just like a place that she would look. It's actually a place she wouldn't look. It's in one of his drawers. And then he's like, Oh, oh that's I think right. maybe I put the cat toy in there. You should like check there. So she like goes to look in there and then finds the ring. So it's like he has to like have this <laughs> weird like escape room esque situation so where like the clues lead to the other clues so she can find the ring. <laughs> You could do that. Or you could just be like, hey, so we already live together. um, And, you know, I know, like, you want to get married eventually. And, like, I want to get married eventually. And, like, I really love you. And, like, do you think maybe you see yourself marrying me one day? And, like, yeah, conversate from there. Why are you doing this? Why do you have to make it so convoluted, Garrick? Just, just (sighs) remember how in the beginning she was like, communication is key. Why are you playing these games, Garrick? Right. Also, I felt like Garrick had basically no personality this entire book until this part where it turns out his personality is like uh, equally overthinking things as much as Bliss is. And yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, so you guys shouldn't. You guys shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Your house is going to be so fraught. <laughs> it's going to be like... You need to go pick up a thing of milk from the the store and you have like an elaborate scavenger hunt that leads to like a note in the bathroom that was like written with dry erase, but then erased. So it only shows when it fogs up that says like, don't forget to pick up milk so that like Bliss remembers to pick up milk. But you can't tell her directly because that would be like telling her what to do. And that's just too much. Like that. He's primed her days beforehand by talking incessantly about cows and goats. <laughs> he, he just keeps looking at her over his, like, mug of water and going, ah, wish this was creamier. <laughs> <laughs> oh my and God. they haven't had milk for two weeks. <laughs> so have you heard about this, like, um, milk thing? I don't know. I think it's, I think it's kind of new. Uh... <laughs> It's a mess. It's, it is a mess, but I still liked it. I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. I don't think it was, it wasn't difficult to read and it mm. wasn't a pain to read. I just, there was a lot of things here that annoyed me and nothing okay. that to me made it a satisfying read, if that makes sense. Okay. So kind of getting into what, what would you like in the next new adult book we read, what are, what are you looking for? Um, we talked about it last time with I the mister think... and did not meet any of those qualifications of this one. So I assume those still hold, but do you have any other thoughts? Yes. I think I want them to be the same age. Okay. I'm not really a fan of one being in college and one not. I think for me, I would prefer if they were both out of college. Just, okay. I don't know. That to me, I'm I'm less removed from that life than I am from college life maybe because I'm so prime adult age mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. that I just, I don't know. I feel like sometimes with campus novels, like college novels in general, there is a bit of immaturity to them. Is okay. that, I don't know if that's exactly what I want to say, but there's just something about them that, 
I don't find realistic and I don't find mature. <laughs> I guess that it, I don't know. I just, it's not my favorite. So, okay. and especially with one having, being the teacher and one being the student, it was just like not a good mix for me. So same age, preferably out of college and mm-hmm. no weird power dynamics. I mean, I could probably be down for like a boss employee situation, you know, like a, okay. like a CEO, um, who's into BDSM. No, I'm just kidding. No, like a CEO and a, um, <laughs> <laughs> and makes you sign a contract. Yeah. Like... And he shows you his special room with his sex jeans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Like as long as the. <laughs> like the more unequal the power dynamic the more okay i feel about it oddly enough i don't know why okay. i don't know why um between this one and the other one we read which was the mister mm. uh, another big difference aside from the sex slavery was that this one only had one point of view what's your feeling on that do you prefer i liked that one better. point of one point of view yes i'm usually not a huge fan of multiple viewpoints because there's always without fail for me i get attached to whatever is the first one i read and i don't want shit from the other ones Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay how are we feeling about love triangles do we need to find one without a love triangle or are they okay you know i would be i would be willing to read i'm always open to a love triangle because i'm not expecting to get into the fandom of whatever this book is so (laughs) okay all that right, I think fun. I have some starting points as to where I need to. Oh, I guess I should say, I think that I am going to restrict this in my search because I talked about this a little bit at the beginning mm-hmm. um, to new adult in the sense of new adult romance, just because I think that is kind of the um, like true form of oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. genre at the moment. So I'm sorry, but we aren't going to be doing new adult spec fic, even though that would probably be way more fun for both of us. Oh, yeah. No, like, I'd eat up some Sarah J. Moss right now. That's Or Lee Bardugo. Yeah, I'd be all over that. But uh, right. I know Ninth House just came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still have to read it. Mm-hmm. Which I guess that kind of gets us into suggested reading for this week. Do you have a book or books that uh, you would suggest after having read this book? Yeah, I, uh, like I said, I just am kind of more enjoying lately or I've noticed recently that this like the new adult kind of mixing in with the YA fantasy that I typically read or when I do read YA fantasy Mm -hmm. um and I'm really enjoying I know we've talked about a ton of times on here um Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom um more recently, Carry On and Wayward Son by Rainbow Roll, which I think we've already talked about. And then um, <laughs> I liked The Gilded Wolves by Roshani Chokshi, mm. which is um, my favorite thing. It's a heist novel. I love reading a good story about thieves just stealing shit. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it would it would kind of probably be a little unfair if we switched over to a new adult spec fic because... Clearly, I'm okay with that. I think it's just like kind of for me. I put, <laughs> I put fantasy and sci-fi and just like it's separate. Like regardless of who it was written yeah. for, it's a fantasy book, and so I right. automatically am, you know, liking it. So, read those. <laughs> How about you? Um, I was kind of thinking about it, and uh, I was having a hard time because, like you, kind of my immediate thoughts were to go to spec fic as well. Um, But I'm going to go ahead and suggest uh, Giant Days, which is a comic book series by John Allison. Yeah. Which is a new adult, technically, I believe. And actually kind of exemplifies. Well, I mean, it's, you know, set on a college campus. It's three roommates uh, trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives and having some romance and um, that Mm -hmm. sort of stuff and you know it's a cute comic i just recently got into it on the advice of a friend and i've read pretty much all of it immediately it either just wrapped up or is just about to wrap up i think i'm trying to remember when it's uh finishing uh it'll be wrapped up i think by the time this episode posts um Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, it's a it's a fun series. And actually, the the only big problem I had with it is that it is like a spinoff of a different uh, web comic that John Allison wrote. And um, that one has more paranormal elements. So there are like occasionally paranormal elements that like briefly show up in this one. And because I haven't read Scary Go Round, which is the other one, I was like, I don't Mm -hmm. get why this is happening right now. (laughs) But it's like really, really brief stuff. It's it's not um, I wouldn't call it uh, like a speculative fiction type of series. It's primarily realistic. Yeah, I had heard about that, and I've seen art from it, but I didn't really know what it was about, but I like the art style, so. Yeah. The I art is um, Max Saren and Lisa Tremaine, I think, are the two primary artists. Yeah, the art's good. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, a variety of things to try. Um, speaking of trying new things, next fortnight we are actually doing a submission from friend of the podcast Morgan who was on ages ago to talk about uh yeah fuck what was the dumb ghost that book ghost that we book about? She, yeah that ghost book but uh she pointed out earlier this summer that there is a new book out in the anonymous diary series which if you guys remember uh we read uh Annie's baby which is by Anonymous, the author of Go Ask Alice and Jay's Journal, which was, of course, Beatrice Sparks, um, who yes. pretended that all of these diaries were real, even though they weren't. The thing is, so this is the same series. It's published by Simon & Schuster. It's titled as By Anonymous, and it is the same like vibe of essentially propaganda. But... Um, Beatrice Sparks is dead so we're not really sure where this book came from or who actually wrote this one and we want to see how it stacks up compared to the other Beatrice Sparks anonymous books and if it is in that same vein of um, very hand ringy warnings about teenage behavior Um, so we will be reading next fortnight Breaking Bailey the most recent addition to the anonymous diary series oh I am not looking forward to that. No, it should be bad. And it's uh, a heart-wrenching story that chronicles a girl's fatal experience with testing her moral limits and the dangers of addiction. And again, I'm assuming this is fiction because all of the anonymous books are, but uh, until we actually get the book, I'm sure it'll it'll probably say somewhere in there, you know, credit to whoever. Um, we'll see. We'll see if we can figure out what the deal is with this super great book. Do we know what she's addicted to? Um, I'm guessing from the bits I've seen, like Adderall or something. That's what I, think... I was thinking too. She's like, prestigious boarding school, rigorous coursework, long hours of studying. Yeah. It, it seems like it's some sort of like, kids taking drugs to help with their schoolwork sort of but i'm not 100 yeah. sure but it, it could be math because like excerpt. breaking bad could right? be math. So, and they say like cooking up drugs oh I think that's a good point meth but that just seems like so <laughs> it seems extreme. very extreme but like also anonymous like go ask alice and jay's journal were already like pretty pretty buck wild in terms of their depiction that's of true teenage drug use i'm pretty sure like doesn't go ask alice end with or not end with but doesn't it include like they have to turn to prostitution and like all oh, that probably. stuff and like jay's journal is like they're all part of a sadistic uh cult or something like that so if this is truly in the vein of these original uh, anonymous books whoever wrote this one um Meth might not be meth might not be a bad guess. <laughs> might it's be meth. Three hundred and eighty four pages long, Em. It's yep. so long. <laughs> I'm gonna die reading this one. Probably right. just like <laughs> Bailey, I'm guessing from the I yeah, this book is breaking vibe. Anna. hmm I might have to take meth just to make through make it through this book. <laughs> Please don't. Oh, boy. 
Um, I guess in the meantime, if you have a submission that you would like to send us, either for a book you think we will hate or a book you think that we will really love and maybe just don't know about it. You know, like if we had read a book in the past and you were like, hey, I have a book that's kind of like Little House in the Big Woods, but it's better. Send it our way. Mm -hmm. You can tweet at us at ShelfAwareCast or email us shelfawarecast at gmail.com. As always, thank you to Ben Cope for the use of our theme song. You can find his YouTube channel in our show notes below. And we are also on all of your favorite podcast aggregating platforms. So if you haven't followed or subscribed to us on one of those, you definitely should. Um, And if you use Apple Podcasts, a five-star review would be very much appreciated. And um, if you don't use it, you can talk about us anywhere on the internet. And we are currently incentivizing you to talk about us to everyone because we have stickers for your enjoyment. If you leave a review or if you share our shit via social media or just like to your friends and you have some proof of that, I guess if you want to yes. send us a screenshot of your group chat, like sure, whatever. Um, yeah. Email us and let us know and we will send you some stickers. Yes. Yes, they are on our Twitter at the moment. They're they're on it. They're on the Twitter. Um, you can see how we have tweeted about them. There are pictures of the four stickers. That is all. <laughs> In the words of Cora Carmack, my mother had told me once when I was little and had a friendship fall apart that some relationships just end. Like a star, they burn bright and brilliant and then nothing in particular goes wrong. They just reach their end. They burn out. Okay, if my mother told me that as a, like, five-year-old, yeah, I would be a theater major, too. Like, <laughs> calm oh down, drama queen. Oh, my God. So dramatic. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk about this, but um, when they first, like, I might just use this as a stinger. When they first, like, uh, or not when they first, but when they actually start going to have sex and they're doing the foreplay, she describes it as words stream from my mouth, some familiar, some not. What? <laughs> Did she just, like, start <laughs> speaking <laughs> <in tongues? laughs> Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's just so sexy. Fliss is unbelievably, ridiculously sexy.